Well, good evening, everybody. Good to see you tonight. Glad you're here. Well, uh, forgot, almost forgot to give the announcements. That happens nearly every week. Problem is, I have to go back and find the email now that I lost last week. Oh, there it is. Okay, so uh, let's see. So we got date night this Friday. It's sold out, so I don't know why I'm announcing that. And, yep, sorry about your luck. Uh, and then uh, family night out. So family night out uh, is uh, February 27th, so 6 to 8. Uh, so we have some really cool things. I think we have uh, Graham Blank, the bowling alley, and the roller skating rink. Roll, uh, Roll Haven, yeah. So, again, if you're over the age of 12... Go bowling, do not roller skate, okay? <laughs> so I just, just feel like I need to say that. Is there? And then a uh, uh, cool thing, early March. So March the 13th, uh, we have ladies' night out. So uh, going to host that at our Holly location. That will be from 5 o'clock to 8.30. So ladies, make sure you mark your calendar uh, for that. So exciting uh, night there, okay? Just want to let you know about a couple of these things. Hi, bud. All right. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for tonight. Thank you for uh, your love for us, your word. Pray for just wisdom tonight as we uh, ask and answer questions. And I pray that you just instruct us tonight. I pray you give us just soft hearts, Lord, to your word and uh, what the Holy Spirit would be saying to us through it. I thank you for one another, Lord. Thank you for our church and just all of the really uh, incredible things that have been happening. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Well, great to see you. Um, we take, if you're new or you're watching online, we take questions every Wednesday. And so if you have any questions about anything, whether it's a church question or Bible question or personal question, you can ask anything you want. We want to make sure that we're um, transparent about everything. And then uh, if you ask a question that I can't answer, I'll tell you I don't know. And then I'll kick it to next week. Or five years from now, I don't know. But I'll just tell you, I don't know, and we'll go from there, okay? So, we got an online question. Will you grab the mic then? And make sure it's on. I think it is. Thank you, Jim. Uh, okay, so how can I know that where I'm at in life is where God wants me and not where I want me? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> that's a great question. Well, let's let's start with some different passages of scripture so open your bibles to the book of romans so there's different ways of if i can reframe the question hopefully that person is okay with that we often ask this question or i hope we often ask this question what is god's will And then we maybe make it a little more personal. What's God's will for me? So does God want me to move? Does God want me to go to school? Who's God want me to marry? Who's God want me to, what job does God want me to take? Does he want me to accept this promotion? Where does God want me to go to college? I mean, the list of questions that we have to ask is really, really quite long and can be uh, overwhelming when we're looking for what um, God's will is. Uh, is I told you to go to Romans, didn't I? We'll come back to Romans. Let's let's go to First uh, Peter. Let's start there. Actually, Second Peter. Actually, Romans. No, I'm kidding. So we'll start in 
Second Peter chapter three. So sometimes uh, there's different ways of looking at this. Um, one of the things we do know is God's will is for people to be on time to Wednesday night. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Come on in, guys. So, man, someone brutalized these markers, by the way. Oh, my heavens. So we could, we could divide this really into the commanded will of God. You're good. So we'll, we'll start with this. So in God's word, there are certain commands. There, there are certain things that God uh, commands us to do. And um, so we're going we're gonna to start there. So 2 Peter chapter number 3 and uh, in verse, oh, let's see. Verse number nine. So it says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, or sometimes it's phrased not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So one of the things we'll see here is we're going to talk about God's commanded will, and then we'll talk about God's sovereign will. And how those, how those interact. So God's commanded will, the first thing we see there in Second Peter is that God commands people to be saved. So God loves the world. He sends His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. So that is the, the first thing to aligning a person's life to the will of God. So you may remember the prayer of Jesus in the garden where he says, Father, if there's any way possible for this cup to pass from me, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And so, um, and we'll, we'll talk about that a, a little bit. So God's sovereign will and humanity and free will and so on and so forth, how those kind of intersect. So Jesus submitted his will to the Father. He was in complete obedience to the Father. Well, right here, this is the first... Um, this is the first step to being in line with the Father's will, is coming and repenting of sins and believing in what Jesus has done on the cross for us. So we are to be saved. That, that is, that's the first thing. So anybody who's not saved cannot be aligned with the commanded will of God, God telling us to do these things. So we, we have to first come to repentance and belief uh, in Jesus. Jump back to the left and go to first. Thessalonians. I'm just going to give you a brief summary of these. There's there's a few more. Um, matter of fact, in the the book we just finished, that Jen and I just finished, there's a chapter on that that deals with some. There's a portion on discernment that deals with discovering God's will. So if you'd like that, you have to buy the book. I'm just kidding. That's that's not ridiculous, but just kidding. So um, anyway, so the the one we'll see there in Second Peter three is we'll see saved. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. First Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse number 3. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. And I am sure that I'm going to misspell that. So. so sanctification. So what does that mean? In this particular case, and we just taught on this back in January, this is the sanctification, becoming more like Christ, becoming more holy to the Lord. And in Thessalonica, it was particularly the issue of sexual immorality. So you'll see it there. This is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from uh, sexual immorality. Um, I think there's one more as well. Jump to the end of the book. And I won't be able to alliterate these now because of this one. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse number 18. You'll see the scripture saying there, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God 
in Christ Jesus for you. So we would call that um, contentment. Or we would say gratitude. Jen, will you remind me of the question again so I can keep working my way to that answer? Are you good? Um, how do I know where I'm at in life is where God wants me and not where I want me? Good. Okay, we'll keep working there. All right, so let's go over now to uh, 1 Peter. We could have done that when we were in 2 Peter, but let's just make it hard. 1 Peter chapter number 2. 1 Peter 2.15. almost wrote first Pete. I've <laughs> never done that before. All right, so first Peter 2:15, uh, we'll start in verse 13 just for context. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil, to praise those who do good, for this is the will of God, that by doing good you would put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. So right there we're seeing and this was in the, within the context of submission to government authorities. And then it builds on that submission first to God, then to government, then in family roles, and then in work roles, and, and all of these different things. So you'll see this, this idea of being submissive. And then let's jump to Romans 12. We'll handle that one now. So Romans chapter 12, uh, beginning in verse 1, says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God. So because of the gospel, because of God's mercy in your life, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, uh, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, and acceptable and perfect. So if you put those two verses together, just kind of in summary, you'll see this idea of being sacrificial. Sacrificial. So, that's the worst R I've ever written. So this is the idea of God's commanded will. So, is everyone in the world or everyone who's ever lived in alignment with those things? Of course not. Is everyone sitting in this room, everyone watching online in alignment with all of those things? Of course not. And so one of the things that we do is we take this question, what is God's will for me? So am I in the spot where God wants me to be? Or am I in the spot where I want to be? And so that's what we really mean by this question. Am I in the job that I'm supposed to be? Are we living in the house we're supposed to be? Am I living in the state I'm supposed to live in? Winter says we're not living in the state that we're supposed to be living in. None of us. So what is God's will for me? So that's how we kind of think of it. Well, one of the things I love about this, and I, I think some of this is from MacArthur actually, but it's, it's looking at what does the scripture say about God's commands to us? So the first thing is to be saved then to be living a life that is sanctified, so becoming more like Jesus as we live. It's living a life of gratitude, contentment where we are, submissive to authority, and then sacrificial. There's a couple more in the scripture, but that's kind of a good summary. So before we ask this question in the, in kind of the existential crisis type way, we need to stop and go, okay, what are the basic things that God has told me to do today? think about it when you were a kid. Sometimes we've had this with our kids. You leave a list for them to do. So let's just imagine this. You leave a list for them to do. Hey, I'm leaving for the next couple hours. I want you to work through these, these 10 things. Or maybe, you know, you don't have kids that age. Maybe you're thinking an employee. Hey, I need you today to get these 10 things done. These are the things I need you to work through. Okay. Real clear. It's in black and white. You hand it to them, you email it to them, whatever. 
At the end of the day, you come to them and you say, or you come home to see your kids and you go, hey, did you get the list done? No, no, I wasn't able to get any of the list done, but I got these other 20 things done. And you're like, um, I didn't ask you to do those other 20 things. It's not like those other 20 things are intrinsically bad things, but I gave you this list of 10 things to do. I, I need you to get that done. And sometimes we, we act that way with the Lord, like the Lord has given us his revelation in the scripture of saying, hey, I want you to do these types of things. But then we, then we start to think, okay, well, I, I don't know what God, I don't know where God is going to want me to live in five years, or I don't know where God's going to want me to go to college, or I don't know where God's going to want me to, you know, who's God going to want me to marry, or how many kids are we supposed to have, or what job am I supposed to, like, we, we get bogged down in those things when God's like, hey, let's just get started with doing the clear things, with doing the clear things. And, and here's why. Because the psalmist said, delight yourself in the Lord. <laughs> Whose was that? That was yours? Oh, it's all good. <laughs> Nothing. She's fantastic. She was going to come in here and run this show in here. But excuse me, I have some teaching to do. So, so the psalmist says, delight yourself in the Lord. That's where we start. Now, how do we delight ourselves in the Lord? We delight ourselves in the Lord by following his commanded will, right? His revelation in the scripture. So the Bible says, delight yourself in the Lord. And then it says, he will give you the desires of your heart. Well, we love that part. My marker's dying. We love this last part. The problem is we don't often delight. So then we go, man, what are the desires of my heart? So then we ask those questions, which aren't bad questions to ask. So if you're asking that question online, it's not, it's not a bad question to ask. I don't want to come across scolding or anything like that. But we get stuck in that question rather than going, okay, Lord, I'm going to delight myself in your salvation. I want you to sanctify me, Lord. I need to be content and, and grateful for where I'm at in life, what I have, submissive to authority in my life, sacrificial with where I'm at. Those doing these things will reshape the desires of our heart. It'll, it'll transform them. I mean, think about this. A lot of times we get... I'm going to go with red now. No, I'm not. <laughs> Two points. That's probably a three. That was three points. Okay. So, so it reshapes the desire of our heart when we are doing these things right here. So we need to do those things, and then what God will do is, it's really funny, MacArthur has a little book called Found, I think it's Finding God's Will, and it makes me laugh, especially coming from him, that you do these types of things, then after you're doing these types of things, do whatever you want. And that seems really weird, because you're like, whoa, 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 I don't want to do whatever I want. Well, if you're in line with these things from the Lord, he's reshaping your desires, he's reshaping your heart, because you're delighting in him, now the desires of your heart are going to be molded and shaped into the direction that he would want you and I to go. Now, one thing about God's sovereign will, okay? So let's look at Ephesians chapter 1. <laughs> and John Stone just texted me and said, why are you hijacking my growth community topic? Whatever. Maybe his is tomorrow. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse number 11. So Ephesians chapter 1 verse 11 says this, In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him, who works all things according to the counsel of his will. So this is where you start to get into a mystery that the only way that I've been able to explain it is through the cross. So kind of this, this vertical I have drawn, you've seen this before, this is, um, let's do it this way. This is the divine will. So you have Jesus in the garden saying, 
not my will, but thy will be done. And here you have human will. To me, that's where they intersect, is at the cross. Because you have Jesus who's fully God and fully man. He's not a sinful man. He's a perfect man. Nonetheless, he is laying down his human will and the divine will. So this is, it's kind of weird when you think about it this way. This is what we're looking for in our life. That's why Jesus said, take up your cross. So the cross was Jesus submitting his will to the divine will of the heavenly father. So what is this? This is us taking our will and submitting it to the divine will of God. This is us saying, God, I don't want my will. I want your will to be done. I don't want what I want. I want what you want. God, what you've given me is so much more than I deserve. I want to be submissive, God, because this is your world and you've ordered things. I want to be sacrificial in the same way that you were sacrificial on the cross. So all of these are rooted in an understanding of this. When it comes to God's sovereign will, we have in the Bible God giving us the beginning of the world And we have God giving us the end of the world. Well, how does that happen? It's because God is working out all things according to the counsel of his will. Now, that does not say we don't have free will. Because I think sometimes people try to settle that tension rather than living in that tension. So there's some mystery there. And so, yeah, we have free will. But at the end of the day, God is completely sovereign and working all things according to the counsel of his will. So there's nothing outside of the scope of of his sovereign will. So, circling all the way back to the question, how do I know? Well, I would use this. I would look at these types of things. For me, this is the one that's going to provide a lot of conviction. Because it's like, God, am I content if nothing else changes in my life? Financially, physically, church-wise, if it all stays the exact same way that it is right now, nothing gets added Nothing gets subtracted. It is what it is. Can I embrace contentment? Maybe, right? That's a hard thing. So I think uh, that's where we have to look and go, okay, where I'm at in life, am I aligned with these things? Is God using those things? Am I obedient to those things? Is he reshaping the desires of my heart? If he is, then... I think you're good. Or not. I mean, that's really, it's really a, a personal time with you and the Lord. Okay? All right. Anybody else? Questions? I'm going to need like at least two more long ones, okay? All right. Let's pass it back to John. And you can ask any question you want. Nothing's out of bounds. All right, so um, you've been talking in Genesis Mm -hmm. about Adam and Eve. And um, I guess my question is, if God knows everything, God knows what we're going to do before we do it. Yep. great question it's uh, it's a bit of a question where you go I I don't understand what God is is doing oh Jen where's the passage at in Isaiah God's ways are not my ways Oh, man, contentment is real hard. So, yeah, so, I mean, let's flip back there. Jen's going to find me that passage real quick because my brain is forgetting. So Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2. Yeah. I always go 33, and it's 55. I knew it was a sequential number. So this idea that God creates the world... And everything is good. He takes the tree of knowledge of good and evil 
and he puts it in the garden. And why would he put it there? Right? If 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 he if he didn't want sin in the world or anything like that, why would he why would he just not chop the tree down, remove the tree, don't put it in Eden, and everything is good. So it's a great question. So let's let's try to answer this with some big some big picture stuff. So I'm going to give you Isaiah 55. You don't have to turn there if you don't want to. I'm going to erase a little bit here. So to me, what I've worked through in my brain is there there are four truths that I think are just foundational in the Bible. I call them the four most important truths. So the first one is God is in complete control. So from the moment of creation, God is God. Okay? So it's not as if Adam and Eve sinned and God was like, I did not see that coming. (laughs) And it's not like God, and I'm not, this borders on sacrilegious, so I want to be careful here. So it's not as if God rallied the Trinity together and said, we need to come up with a plan to, to redeem this. So when we say God is in complete control, what we mean is there has always been one plan since the foundation of the world. So it's not a reactive plan. The reason we say that is, number one, God's in complete control all things exist for his glory. So over and over again, you'll see in the New Testament, this idea, by him, through him, to him, were all things made that were made. So everything exists for his glory. So I would say the way that I approach the tree is that God was giving Adam and Eve the greatest gift. He was giving them himself. And he wanted them to be satisfied in him. All right, that's the, that's the whole totality of the Christian life is to find our complete satisfaction in the Lord. Not what the Lord gives, but who the Lord is. So we find our joy, we find our rest, we find our peace, we find our purpose, our satisfaction in him. And so that, that was happening in the garden. And they were in perfect fellowship. Well, what did Satan do? And we, over the last two weeks, we looked at it from a human standpoint. But we could look at it from the divine standpoint. What was Satan doing? Satan was driving a wedge, not just between Adam and Eve. Satan was driving a wedge between Eve and God. Did God actually say? And so he questions God's word, God's command. And then Eve responds, we're not supposed to touch it, don't eat of it, and the day we eat of it will surely die. And Satan says, God knows. Right? That's, that's not so. God knows that in the day you eat of it, you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So the, the lie comes in there. There's the question of God's word. There's the, there's the contradiction of God's word. And then there's the redefining of God's word. So there's the assault on who God is. God is keeping something from you. So they made a choice to choose satisfaction in another way. We all do it. It's the same choice. Is it, is it God's will that I want for my life? Or is it my will? And I think if we're all honest, we really want our will. We're really happy when our will and God's will aligns because it makes it easy for us. But we really want our will. And so there's the whole movement of the Holy Spirit that causes us to even submit our will to God. So in the garden, he makes that. He's in complete control. All things exist for his glory. But God's ways are not our ways. So this is what makes, this is what makes God redeemer. Even sin 
is redeemed. Even evil is redeemed. Job chapter 1 and 2, Satan can do nothing to Job without the direct permission from God. So this idea that Satan and God are in this epic clash of the titans and we're in the middle like, nope. Nope. God's in complete control. Satan can do nothing without God saying, you can do that. The pigs, when, when um, Jesus comes to the other side of the Sea of Galilee and he comes to the Gadarenes or the Gerasenes, this demonic possessed man, actually it's probably, it's two guys come up to him and, and they, ha- they had to bow in submission to Jesus. They were terrified that Jesus was going to bind them in chains in hell in that exact moment. And so Jesus says, no, you can go into that, you can go into that herd of swine. Like, so he, he allows that to happen. So it was by divine command that they were allowed to do that. They, they couldn't choose what they were going to do. So they were under submission of God. So when we say all things exist for God's glory, we mean all things. I mean, that means evil, that means death, that means sin, and God redeems that. So you look at that and go, to your point, why not just rid the world of evil? Right? Why not just take the tree of the knowledge of good and evil out? And here's where we come to Isaiah 55, which I love. God's ways are not our ways. So verse 8 there, Isaiah 55, 8, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts, um, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So the idea is that God's thoughts are, it's like being a parent. I don't want to keep coming back to this illustration, but when you're when you have a toddler and you explain, "Hey, don't cross the road." Well, you and I all know stories of someone who's been hit by a car, or we or someone that's had a, you know, a tragic accident or what. So we know those things. We have that perspective. Our perspective is higher than our child's. Magnify that by God, who's eternal and timeless. So his perspective is is eternal he's outside of time so we might look at this and go okay god's in complete control if you're in complete control rid the world of evil well all things exist for his glory that means everything and then god's ways are not our ways so that's why you know going back to what i said earlier about the beginning and the end what's the whole story of the bible the whole story of the bible is god's glory what's the whole story of creation it's god's glory so here is god who needs nothing, is in fellowship with himself, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and begins to create. And his creation rebels against him. So rather than smiting the creation, he redeems the creation. That's why when we get to heaven, we'll sing to the glory of the Lord because we'll see that picture you know the bible talks about seeing in a a glass half dimmed and all these things we'll see with eyes wide open and clear oh my goodness this is what the lord did for us this is this is the glory of god this is the depravity of sin and the fact that god would make a way for us to be saved that god would take sin and put it upon his son this is nuts um it's one of the reasons like when we we talk about the divine. Sorry, I'm gonna, I, we wrote some of this in the book, by the way, so my, my head has been there for six months. So sorry not to think through some of those things. You know, you look at um, humanity's response to false gods and goddesses. It was always you had to put the god or goddess that you worshipped into a better mood. So whether that was financial sacrifice whether that was animal sacrifice in a lot of cases whether it was human sacrifice the whole idea was we need to appease the gods and so we have to do whatever we can to appease the gods the only way to appease our god is god did it himself for us so he's the one who's worthy of praise we can't even touch the credit so that's why god's ways are not our ways and then the last one is god loves me he loves you You can make that personal. So, to me, when I look at the, the story, the overarching story of the scripture, including the Garden of Eden, it was God creating us to be in fellowship with him. 
we rejected that fellowship. And so what did God do? God made a way for us to return in fellowship with him through Christ. And so you see stories of that all the way through the Old Testament, the, the types and shadows of the cross, thing, giant arrows who are pointing us to the cross, things like the flood. God looks at the world and he says, every thought in man's heart is violent and wicked. Uh, I'm going to destroy the earth. But then Noah finds favor. Well, who's Noah a picture of? Noah is a picture of Christ. Noah is a picture of Christ finding favor with God. And so what does God do? God comes into fellowship with Noah and God makes a way through the ark for his family and then for creation to be saved. And so you just start to see all of those pictures pointing to, I think for us, we, we, we just want to earn it. And, and I think when we look at the story of the garden of Eden, we all have a raging rebel inside of us and God is the one who loves us in spite of that and then rescues us. And so I think why it's there is because God wants us to choose him. God wants us to choose to be in fellowship with him. Uh, and again, I know that when you start to deal with sovereign election and free will, it's a, it's a mystery. Both are in the Bible very clearly, so we can't fall into one ditch or the other. We just have to live in this mysterious tension and, and, and accept that. But um, yeah, the, the tree of knowledge of good and evil is there because God says, I'm going to give you all these trees. Just don't eat of this one. Well, what's the one tree that we want to eat of the moment God says don't eat of that tree? Even if the fruit is terrible tasting and all of these over here are wonderful, I just got to try it, right? I mean, I was the kid when my mom said don't touch the iron. I'm like, well, why? And I remember touching it. And I was like, well, that's why. But I was so mad. This is, this is how defiant I was as a child. Just as a child, by the way. I'm still not defiant. <laughs> I remember the iron being unplugged. I'm like, now I can touch it. And I walked up to it and touched it again. It was still hot. (laughs) So I was the idiot that had to do it twice just to go, yeah, I'm not going to do that again. All right. So, I mean, we, the Lord wants us to choose him to be in fellowship with him. But the big story is that God, it's all about God's glory. So the whole, the whole overarching story is God's redemptive story of making creation creation rebelling against him and then god rescuing and redeeming creation for his glory and um so heaven exists for the glory of god and hell exists for the glory of god how god gets glory out of that i don't know but his ways are not my ways and one day when we get to heaven we'll see that and go oh okay i don't think it'll be a moment of oh okay i think it'll be millions of years then we'll finally go I'm starting to grasp this a little bit so anyway somebody else question yes we'll pass that over thank you sorry Jim you got stuck with the microphone duty I apologize so um, I was talking to a patient today and we were talking about I was going to church and Bible study and he said well I'm, I'm angry at God because my daughter passed away from ovarian cancer. Mm. I don't like that, you know, God took her so young. Mm-hmm. How do I respond to that? Sure. Well, those are always sensitive, sensitive uh, issues. Um, some people don't want an answer, and, I, and that sounds cynical to say some people do not. And I think in those moments we have to really pray for wisdom as to what people need from us in that moment. Um, do they need just someone to listen and to, to care? Because sometimes that's, that's the best thing to do. Um, you know, I, I have found that whenever you're, you're helping someone navigate through grief, it's really treacherous territory. Um, so I have found some little, I mean, some things that I do when someone says, you know, my child passed away, my dad passed away, I always ask what their name name was or name is. And so so that in the conversation I can say their name, you know, because it means something to people, like their memory, you know, your your child's memory, your spouse's memory, your dad, your mom, they're st- they, they still matter. Like they're not like erased from existence, like they still matter. And uh, so grief is hard. It's It's, you know, uh, it's a, it's a difficult thing, so I think it's it's listening to to people. Um, if it's someone who's a Christian, 
I try to bring them here because I feel like these are real. Um, it's, it's truths of substance. And I've found in different conversations when people are ready for that, you can give them some, some kind of some anchor points to, to really um, find some stability. But the, it's a hard conversation. You know, I've had these conversations with people. I, I remember I had a conversation with my friend who's lost two daughters. And um, so his, his first daughter and his third daughter. And, um, and I, I've had that conversation with him. And he was courageous enough to hear it. You know, he asked me, why does this happen? And I said, do you, you want to know the real reason? And he said, I really do. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to walk you through this. And this is not going to be like, I think a lot of times when it comes to grief, I think we just like to lie to people because we want to make ourselves feel better. We want to make them feel better. But it's like, it's like a placebo. It's like cotton candy. It doesn't, it's, it doesn't, doesn't, it doesn't do anything. So, I mean, I, I remember walking my buddy through this and, and, um, it was a really pivotal conversation in my life, I think in his life as well, because it gave him real things to wrestle through. And, uh, so I think, you know, in those types of conversations, I think sometimes we're afraid to talk about this, that God loves you. Um, I'm, I've never squared with or settled in my mind being mad at God. That's always, a, that's always been a strange thing to me. I think, and I'm not trying to say I'm super Christian or deep theological thinker, but I'm afraid of God, right? The fear of the Lord is a thing that I really have. So saying I'm mad at you is a, like a really strange, it's not that I've never been frustrated with God or mad at God, but that's a really, it, it's, it's a hard thing for me to even in my own personal life to think about saying, but there are people who get frustrated with God and God's plan. And I think sometimes we try to, we try to defend God. And I don't think we need to do that. I mean, the Bible says, First Peter says, uh, I think it's First Peter 5, 7, cast all your cares upon him, he cares for you. So I think when you talk about those cares, it's also those doubts and those questions. Like we can come to God and we can say, God, I why did you do this? And you know, the Bible never says don't ask God why. I think that's just a nice little, I say nice. I think that's a mean little Christian cliche we throw at people. Well, don't ask why. Who says like sometimes we want to go to God and be like, God, why did it work out this way? Like, what are we doing? Like you can rest in all things exist for his glory. So how, God, how are you going to get this glory? And I know you love me and I know you love this person, but I don't, I don't, I don't know how this is all going to settle. Uh, even Job had to say that. I've, I brought you to that pass. I brought us to that passage a few times. Job 19, where he says, I know that my redeemer lives and at the last days, my eyes will see him. And uh, so Job had to settle in the fact that God was going to, God was going to settle all the accounts. He was going to square all this up. So I think you can, in those moments, um, now you think you can talk about, um, you know, God loves you. He really does. God's big enough for your questions. God's big enough for your doubts. And, um, and when anybody has lost a child, I always say God knows what it's like to lose a child. He, he watched his only son die. And he did that for us. So I, I, it's, it's going from there as gently and as quickly to the gospel because that's the power. And um, so I, I think we have to say true things. I think saying, you know, oh, well, she's looking down on us or she can hear us or like... No, I don't. I don't think that's. I don't think that's substantive help. I, I don't think that's real help. I think we as Christians give people the truth. We give the truth in love because it's an anchor. Again, it's an anchor point where you're not going to get tossed around. It's like you can you can lock in and go. Okay, I know these things are true. And um, so, in that type of thing, I mean, I would I would very simply, you know, tell me what was your daughter's name? What was she like? What she like to do? Uh, and hear those stories. And you can say, you know what? God created her. She was made in the image of God. And God sent Christ to die on the cross for her sins. And he rose from the dead. Same for you. Same for me. And God offers us a way to have peace with him, to have forgiveness for our sins, the hope of eternal life, because we're all going to face death one day. 
Um, and you can say, well, I'm just mad at God for doing that. And you can say things like, well, I understand. That's, that's got to be very frustrating and confusing. So it's affirming people that, yeah, those are frustrating, scary, hard things that we all you know, have to face at some point. So that's how I would do that. Um, the other thing is, I, again, if you're going to have those conversations regularly, you're going to have to practice them. I know that sounds weird. I've had enough practice because I've done this stuff for a long time now. I've been doing ministry for 20 plus years. So I've had, I've been forced into a lot of those conversations. You're like, oh crap, they just asked me a question. I better know how I'm going to answer this. Well, you just, you do it enough times, you can start to piece some stuff together how to do it. So, so it's practicing that. It's thinking about that. It's preparing for that. It's asking the Lord in those moments. I love the passage in Nehemiah. I think it's Nehemiah 1 or Nehemiah 2 where the king, uh, Nehemiah was the cupbearer. And uh, Nehemiah hears word of his, uh, the people of Jerusalem are in catastrophe. The walls are down, the gates are burnt up, all these different things. And the king asks him, hey, why are you upset? And the Bible says that Nehemiah prayed. Well, he had been praying for months and months and months prior to that. But then when the king saw him upset, he had a silent, very quick prayer. So I think it is a combination for us for gospel preparation moments to be praying prior to those moments, but then also, you know, in those moments to be silently praying, like, God, help me in this moment. Help me not to say anything dumb. Help me not to dishonor you. I mean, I, there's times where I'm preaching where I'm also praying because there'll be something that I'm about to say or something that is distracting or something. I'm like, Lord, help, help me through this. And um, so... It doesn't have to begin with dear Jesus and it doesn't have to end with in Jesus' name, amen. It's just a, a, a plea and you see that from Nehemiah as well. So. Okay. Yes. Pass that back. I have two questions. You're only allowed one. <laughs> Pick First a good one. one. Should be easy. Is oh, there a, yeah. Is there a, like a commentary or resources that, or an author that you know that like dives into Genesis 2? more of it out I mean yeah there's tons of stuff certain passages like you get like on the Sermon on the Mount the amount of resources particularly in English that we have are like when I was prepping to teach this last fall for October and November so I just went to my library and it was like okay I'm not going to be able to sort through all of these every single week for every single passage so I had to prioritize the you know, the top 10 or whatever it was because it was so many books written on it. Yeah, so you get into Genesis. I mean, there's some some good information. Uh, one of the commentaries I use is uh, Preaching the Word. Uh, Kent Hughes is the editor. He also wrote the first edition uh, or the first, the Genesis commentary, which is a good one. A commentary series, I've been, I've been reading a book from, I've been reading a book on, Christ-centered expository preaching. Uh, it's written by Daniel Aiken. It is on Song of Solomon. So we're thinking about, I think we're going to teach on Song of Solomon next uh, February for the family series. Um, so I don't, I don't think we're going to write a book. I think we might use this book. We'll see how that all rolls out. But um, I've been enjoying that. So the whole very, very solid, very, in my opinion, very um, accessible teaching I'm very pretty certain they have a Genesis one as well. It's paperback. Um, at least the one I have for Song of Songs is paperback. I think the Song of Solomon one was like 15 bucks. So maybe the Genesis one's a little thicker because it's 50 chapters as opposed to, I think, eight. But um, that would be solid stuff you can get. Good for you. No, I would love some like uh, <laughs> cliff notes of your like what you need to go from that. Cliff notes of Leviticus. Throwing <laughs> yeah. it out. Ooh. Don't have to do the whole book, just like highlights. <laughs> it's actually my middle name, not Leviticus, but Levi. 
So Leviticus was the instruction from God to the Levites. Okay. So what you'll see in Leviticus is centered around worship. That's what you're going to see in Leviticus. So that is the, there's really from Exodus, Leviticus, you're transitioning from the civil laws, uh, civil laws and moral laws of God. And you're beginning to deal with more of the ceremonial laws, how to approach God, the worship of God, how the sacrifices in the tabernacle and then later the temple will work. Um, So no, I would not claim to be a great student of Leviticus. Um, it, the precision. So I think the takeaway, uh, honestly, Sam is, is looking at the worship there. And then another thing would be the sacrificial system. And then whatever, whatever new Testament passages, cause there's quite a few passages in the new Testament from Leviticus to my recollection, um, tying that into how did Jesus become the perfect sacrifice, the perfect priest, um, the tabernacle, Hebrews talks about it, so I would probably read those somewhat in parallel. Uh, Hebrews talks about um, Jesus going into the real temple, meaning the way that the temple, or the tabernacle first and then the temple was set up are a copy of the real one, which is in heaven. Um, So the Holy of Holies was this secret, not secret room, but this, this, the most holy place where the Ark of the Covenant was not the one from Indiana Jones. It looked very different, which was really disappointing when I learned that. But uh, that's where the high priest would go in and he would sprinkle the blood and all those things and the glory of God would be there. That was a copy of the throne room of God. Jesus went in as the high priest and as the sacrifice into the presence of God. And that's why at the cross, the, um, the veil in the temple was torn in two because now God was, but now Christ, God through Christ, we would say was making a way for us to be back in fellowship with him. And so I think one of the things you could read in Leviticus, I don't want to discourage the reading of Leviticus, but some of me thinks it's, it's somewhat good to be, overwhelmed by the details of Leviticus because you go, man, I'm so thankful for Jesus. I'm so thankful for what Christ has done for me because it's, it's unreal. What were you going to add? Nothing. I, I actually, so I'm just starting back through Genesis with the beginning of the year and last year when I read it, I, it was the first year in all of my years that I actually really enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was trying to just look back through my notes to see like, why did I enjoy it? Um, and I'm just, I'm just laughing at myself with some of the notes. <laughs> yeah. I texted Sam my favorite verse. Okay. Yeah. It says, all fat is the Lord's. Mm-hmm. It just makes me feel better. You're so funny. Them. You're so ridiculous. Um, there's goat demons in Leviticus. Come on. That's goat demons. Yes. yes. There's all sorts of fun stuff. Aaron and his sons. Mm-hmm. Um, that he doesn't speak up for when they are being crazy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's again, there's some narrative there which will help, but I I think the details are meant to to help us know what the Levites needed to do in worship of God, in honor of God, in sacrifice to God. So that was a really sacred thing, and it was not it was not playtime. I think it will also help us in some ways, not just be thankful for Jesus, but it will help stir in us a more fearful approach to God. Right, the fear of the Lord being a good thing. And then also reverence in our worship because sometimes we're just very care careless in that. It talks about the punishment for disobedience in there. That was really Yeah. That's a heavy things. I mean you you're you you're dealing with again, you're dealing with some civil laws there for sure. But um it's it's no joke. I mean that that's where you're coming out of the the Exodus and here's what God is laying down for how he is going to be approached. It is not in the flippant way that we often do. And so I, I think as I've read it, you know, occasionally those are the things that come to mind. Cause I'm like, oh my goodness, this is so precise. There's just a very, there's a seriousness with how the Lord is approached. Uh, there's not a carelessness in that. 
So, okay. You're going to add one more? No. You're so funny. All right. Somebody else? Questions? We got a few more minutes, maybe 15 minutes. You can ask anything you want. Let me pass that up. Back to uh, Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. uh, this past Sunday, you, you know, you were talking about when God created Eve. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I, I took out of that, it was kind of interesting. When God created all the animals and everything, it appears he made male and female. Mm -hmm. So did he, obviously he planned the way that played out. Mm -hmm. Did he have Adam look at everything so Adam would be more appreciative of Eve? Yeah, I think, that's, I think so. I think those verses there in uh, Genesis 2, uh, 18 down to verse number 20 is preparation for Eve. I think it is him looking at all of creation and going, there's no one like me. There's there's no human. And, um, you know, people are made in the image of God. So the ability to communicate, the ability to talk, the ability to reason, um, you know, emotions, all of the things that... that coalesce and come together in humanity not that animals ca don't communicate they do communicate and not that animals don't feel emotion to some level they do but when you put all those things together and we're god breathes into us the breath of life we're, we're a living soul we're eternal beings it sets us apart so adam being so brilliant is looking and going well you're like this and you're not like me you're like this and you're not like me you're not like this or you're like this and you're not like me so that's where the song or really the poem in verse 23, this is at last bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. So he was prepared looking at all of creation going, there's no one like me. She's like me. She's like me. She's different than me. So again, he doesn't call her woman. He calls her uh, woman or he doesn't call her man. He calls her woman. So uh, I-S-H I think is the Hebrew for man. So Adam and then I-S-H-A I think is the Hebrew for woman. So there was there was an acknowledgement of sameness, but there was an acknowledgement of uniqueness, of difference there. So yeah, the creation, it's a cool thing. I'd never really seen it before. That whole passage prepares him for celebration of his wife and fellowship for his wife, fellowship with his wife. Yep. For sure. Anybody else? can ask anything you want about anything you want and I'll do my best to answer it I may do a terrible job but I'll try we do with the Old Testament law? It's a great question. Let's go to uh, Galatians. So this is a this is a great question that we have to understand. Um, you know, let's go to two spots, actually. Go to Galatians and then go to Romans 3. So we have to understand first what the purpose of the law is. And I know you, the question implied, you know what that is. So I just want to start with there. When we talk about the law, we're talking about the 600 plus laws that God gives summarized in the Ten Commandments. And so what is the purpose of the law? So Romans chapter 3 and verse 19. Paul says, Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the knowledge, excuse me, since through the law, 
comes knowledge of sin. So the purpose of the law, just working it in reverse order, is to reveal to us our sin. Is to say, hey, we're, we're sinners, and we compare our life to the law, and we go, I don't match up with the law. So verse 20, by works of the law, no human being will be justified. So there might be some people say, well, I'm going to live up to the standards of the law. No, you are not. That's an impossibility because the purpose of the law is to reveal sin. Verse number 19. The whole world is held accountable to God by the law. The whole world has no excuse. So every mouth is stopped. And then in verse 19, the beginning there, and we see this kind of hint, there are those who are under the law and there are those who are not under the law. Now let's go to Galatians chapter number 5. To, your, to the bigger point, Todd, Galatians is all about this. Galatians was all about um, understanding the purpose of the law for Christians. So we'll look at Galatians 5 in a moment. Before we do that, we'll start in uh, chapter 3. So Galatians 3. O foolish Galatians! Who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by or completed by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain? If indeed it, it, it was in vain... Does he who supplies the Spirit to you who works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. So here it is. There were people in the city of Galatia, so the Galatians, who knew that they had been saved by the hearing of the gospel, so publicly portrayed, Jesus, the, the story of Jesus, Jesus crucified, buried, risen from the dead, the only way to be saved. So they heard that, and they responded in faith. They believed that, and they were saved. So that moment of salvation, that moment of what we would call justification. Now something crept into the Galatian church where they were saying, okay, you're saved by grace, and then for the rest of your life, you're going to have to live up to the standards of the law. Like that's what's going to bring you to completion. Or that's what that phrase there in verse 4 means, uh, perfected by or ending with. What's going to bring you to the finish line is going to be following these rules. And Paul's like, whoa, 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 whoa. You started by the Spirit. You will be kept by the Holy Spirit. Now look at verse uh, chapter 5 and verse number 16. So some would say, right, well, we don't have those rules. How are we not going to sin? How are we not going uh, to fall into that again? We need rules. Verse 16, but I say to you, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are... And do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ, is, Christ will be no advantage to you. He says, I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he's obligated to keep the whole law. So some, some in Corinth were like, well, no, 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 no. We're only going to pick certain amounts of the law, particularly circumcision. So you need to make sure you're circumcised so you're saved. If you're not, then you're not saved. Paul's like, well, if you're going to do that, keep the whole law. Actually, he'll get to the point where he'll tell him to, in verse number 12, I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. Like, I wish they would stop. If they're going to tell you to circumcise, I wish they would just cut everything off for themselves. Like, that's how frustrated Paul was getting. It's a pretty violent statement, okay? Some of your faces are like, oh my gosh, the Bible's terrifying, okay? So, so they were coming into Corinth and they were saying, hey, great, you were saved by faith, grace, the Holy Spirit, you're now going to be kept by the law. Well, then there were people going, well, not all the law, some of the law. 
And so Paul says, listen, if you're taking some of the law, take the whole thing. Take the whole thing, and here it is, verse number two, Christ will be of no advantage to you. You, You've rejected the good news of grace, you've rejected the gospel for this weird, morphed, law-based relationship with God. And we know no one by obeying the law can be saved. Now back to verse number 16. Excuse me, verse number 18. If you're led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual morality, purity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, things like these. I warned you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Here's the phrase. Against such things there is no law. So, we are freed from the law. 100%. Now, does that mean, sweet, we can go out and we can kill somebody if we want? Of course not. Because it's not as if now the Holy Spirit is going to lead in contradiction against the law. So, what purpose does the law have for us? Some have tried to slice it. They slice it in different ways. You have the ceremonial laws. You have the civil laws. You have the moral laws. So, the moral laws continue for all eternity. I don't think so. I don't think the Holy Spirit's going to contradict them and be like, well, you know, now you can go kill a person or now you can go steal that person's stuff. No, because we're now governed by the fruit of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit leads us and it's not like we're going to live in contradiction to the moral laws of God because, again, that's why Paul says it. You're, you're led by the Spirit. You'll not gratify the desires of the flesh. So it's not going to be the law or rules that are going to keep you from indulging the flesh. It's only going to be the Holy Spirit that keeps us from doing that. So we're not under the law. If we're saved and led by the Holy Spirit. We'll have these things being produced in our life, verse 22 and 23. And guess what? Against such things, there is no law. So what's the purpose of the law? I think the purpose of the law is salvation. Meaning, it's a gospel tool. People who don't know Jesus need to know what the perfection, to Sam's question about Leviticus, and I'd stretch it to Exodus too, what the holiness of God really is, what the thorough holiness of God is. You have to keep all these different rules. We can't. We can't keep those. So it's from there saying to someone, well, because your life has fallen short of the Ten Commandments, you fall short, Romans 3.23, of the glory of God. The wages of sin, right? Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. So what does the law do? The law condemns. And here's the thing that we have in the scripture. We have the law, we can say that, and the laws of God are written on people's hearts. So you're, you're appealing to something that God has written on their hearts and it's condemning them. So what do people do? They either run to grace or they run away from it and make all kinds of excuses for running away from salvation. Well, that can't be sin or God's mean or you know the, the litany of things that people would say uh, to not submit to the Lord. So what does the law have? I don't think, personally, I don't think the law has any place for a believer. None. I think it's out. We're not under the law. I think the place that it has for us is a tool of the gospel, of, of sharing the gospel with people. I think it's a conviction of the word of God that helps people see that they're sinners that leads them, right? It's the bad news that precedes the good news of the gospel. So that's the place that I think it, it sees us in. I think we can look and study the law. So I'm not saying, hey, skip Exodus and Leviticus, never read it. I think we need to look and go, man, I fell way short of all of God's holy standards and Jesus rescued me from that. And so I think that could be a, a continued purpose. But from a moral guide, from a rule standpoint, no. No, we're out. Some people want to say the Sabbath is eternal. You go to Colossians, it says the Sabbath is our rest in Christ. So that's that portion of it's fulfilled. We're not going to break the Ten Commandments because we're going to love people. We're going to have joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. <clears throat> so by saying the law... <coughs> is is out doesn't mean that we're now going to live in contradiction to it. Um, you know, even Jesus would, I think we, you could even make an argument, we're going to live a higher standard than the law established. 
Because Jesus said, if you look at a woman with lust in your heart, you've committed adultery with her in your heart already. Well, Jesus was given the heart of the law. Well, what did, the, what did Christ come to do? Christ came to fulfill the law. He didn't come to um, destroy the law. He came to fulfill it. So we can't live up to the law. Jesus did that for us. So the, my favorite illustration is the report card. Jesus gets an A+, plus, we get an E, and Jesus is like, let's trade. I'll take your failure, and I'll give you my perfection. Now, and his perfection before God was that he never broke the laws. He lived in perfect alliance to, I mean, you think about it, read Exodus and Leviticus and go, Jesus lived in perfect alliance to all of these. He's holy. He's righteous, and I'm not. So no, I think it's out. I think it's out. I don't think we'll live in contradiction to it. But I don't think we read the Ten Commandments and go, we've got we to gotta keep these. Well, no, we're, we're going to keep them because the Holy Spirit is going to convict us. And, um, and convict us in ways that maybe the Ten Commandments wouldn't. <laughs> so, that's what I say. That's my opinion about the law. Okay. All right, it's 8 o'clock. Thanks for some good questions. I hope that was remotely helpful for you. Um... Sunday going to be teaching on parenting. At least that's the plan. So, and because Jen and I are perfect parents, it'll be a great lesson. So, uh, just kidding. Just kidding. Oh my gosh, yes. Yeah. Just the middle of the sermon. But you know, John is going to come up here and talk to us about parenting young adults. So, John. So. I, it's funny, I, I sang at a church one time uh, years ago. So I went to this little church, and I was singing, did my old shtick, sang my songs, got done, sat down, and the pastor gets up, and he goes, you know, and I was probably 17, maybe 18, I don't know. Pastor gets up, and he's like, oh, I'm, just, I'm just hearing from the Lord that Brother Josh is supposed to preach today. Now keep in mind, I was not a preacher. And at that point in my life, up till about 20 Four, I did not think I would be a preacher. So I was like, what in the world? So I got up there and I meandered through something and I just remember his face going, yeah, I don't think that was the Lord who told me to do it. <laughs> so, so John, if that happens on Sunday, I'm sorry, man. I'm just, just, just feeling the Lord's movement. That uh... <laughs> Brother John, could you come up here? <laughs> Anyways, all right, everybody, let's pray together. Lord, thank you for tonight. Thank you for your word, and thank you for who you are, for sending Christ, Lord, to die for us in our place, to live the perfect life, Lord, that we could not live to die the death, as Keaton often prays, Lord, that we deserve to die. Lord, you rose from the dead. It's through you and you alone that we are saved, and then it's only through your power and the strength of the Holy Spirit that we can walk in holiness and sanctification to you, Lord. We praise you for that, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Good night, everybody.
So light at yeah. eleven. I'm like, I mean, I do have more people. Oh, <laughs> um, so I will get you added in Tiffany and Lisa and I tomorrow. Okay. And you'll get an email from okay. us okay. from it okay. when okay. it's done. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Some our own medicine. Yeah, <laughs> it just is normal. Like, I don't think you need that. Have a good night.